EKGs. Now, killer EKGs are basically all the things that should be keeping you up, up at night and probably is, and you're, you're right to be, to be worried. So we're going to talk about this. This is in our part of our EKG winter wonderland. So um, I thought that was fun. The, the music Ruben chose, <laughs> so festive, so cute. Um, I'm wearing my jacket too, to uh, represent the cold burr, how, how freezing it is. Um, so let's kick it off. So again, I think I already did this great introduction earlier, just to kind of show you my background. But I also lecture all over the country um, at different PNMB conferences. I run a series called STEMI with Remy, who's our EKG Reading German Shepherd. And um, this is where I live over here in Monterey. And uh, just a little bit more background on me. But let's get down to what is most important. And that's the guidelines update, which we're going to talk about. And also why knowing STEMI is not enough anymore. What the lawyers know that you must know too. Okay, so that's really important. Oh, Allison says, love you, Remy. He's in the next room sleeping, which is a miracle. So before we actually really deep deep dive into everything, what I wanted to make sure we talked about was the pink elephant in the room. So I had a, a member of our 30-day EKG challenge reach out to me yesterday, or was it the day before? And she, she said, I'm really nervous about this patient and this EKG. And so she sent it to me. And it was a one of the STEMI equivalents, and she was going to refer the patient to cardiology. And I was like, mm, maybe you should rethink that. Now, this is a pretty seasoned provider, and it just really highlighted for me that it doesn't really matter how long you've been practicing. The landscape keeps changing, and I don't know really almost anybody who's super comfortable with EKG. So we all have some level of discomfort. And that's the pink elephant in the room because when you're working with people, you're like, oh, that person's comfortable. It just must be me. I'm alone, but you're not. And so I just want to share with you that all that time you're spending beating yourself up about not being good at EKGs is A, not time well spent, spending on studying this stuff, but also knowing that Partly it's not your fault because you weren't taught the right things in school and then you weren't given the right tools. Okay, so just to go back, I remember in my my class, I was taught, um, yes, Hillary, exactly. Hillary says, nine years being a primary care NP. So I applaud you, Hillary, because you're taking time on a Saturday to beef up your knowledge so you can be a better provider for your patients. And I 100% applaud you for that. But in school, you're not given a lot of guided practice. You're you're taught one at a time STEMI, which is just one STEMI at a time. And maybe you just get a little bit of a smattering of that, but not really anything, you know, to the depth of what you need to know to be safe. And then you're taught the intervals don't matter. Maybe you're shown a few arrhythmias and then that's it. And you're like, okay, go on your way and hope that works out for you. Meanwhile, uh, somebody else just messaged me yesterday um, and she was like, I really think I need to quit my job. I, I just don't know what I need to know. So again, you can never learn all you need to know in school. That's the problem. But again, we're focusing on the wrong things. So I respectfully disagree with that way of teaching. And I really think that if we could spend our time after we learn the basics, focusing on those things that will burn us if we miss them, that's time well spent, right? So that's why I've kind of structured this class around, you know, let's take out the fluff. Let's not talk a ton about access because there's very few times it really even matters, right? Let's spend time on the things that are mimics that are new guidelines that you're not going to meet, see, right? So um, yeah, Bedside RN, this class has made me more aware. We love you, Missy. Um, that would be heavy shame to quit over that. I know, right? Exactly. I agree. And this is totally a judgment-free zone. So you are all in the right place. And um, Tanya says she learned everything she knows on the job. She's a sponge and asks us questions. That's the way to do it. So anyway, how long does it take to really feel confident? How many hours in school did we get? Not enough. It takes a long time. And even, even when you have as much experience as I do in cardiology, do I still sometimes ask my docs about EKGs? Yes. Is that a weakness? No, 
You know what's a weakness? A weakness is not feeling like you can ask because of an ego or because you think someone's going to look at you funny. At the end of the day, the only thing that matters is getting the right answer for our patient. However, we have to do that. So going back to the basics for a minute. Um, yeah, I know you learn something all the time. I know. Thank you, KJ. So here's the other problem. And Michelle did a great job in the beginning of showing us that the heart is a 3D object and we're picking up the 3D object on a flat piece of paper. And that's a conceptually a hard thing to understand, which is why she uses the cameras. And she does a whole um, one and a half hour session of learning on this hands-on in our 30-day EKG challenge. And then she does pr practice session on it. So you really cement it. But no wonder we have problems with this, right? This flat piece of paper is supposed to represent this whole heart in the circulation. And it's supposed to tell us how big the heart is and all the other things. Well, it can. You just need to know how to speak the language. Side note, because I have ADHD, um, does anybody know what waves, what wave this is? Just as a fun little side note, what is this called? Does anybody know? These are called what waves? These are called, let's see what we have in the chat. Yes, good job. Q waves, exactly. The Q waves, are they pathologic? They are, they're at least one third the height of the R waves. So that's why the CKG made the cut. All right, so here's the other thing that um, happened in November of 2022 that I wanted to emphasize. There was a release of an article that came out and it was written for the ER folks. It was a consensus guideline on how to manage chest pain in the ER. And so if you were eating turkey or, you know, like having some relaxing time around the holidays and didn't work in the ER, you may have missed this article, but it affected all of us. And that's why I'm so mad that this article didn't make the mainstream. I'm gonna show you the article in a second. Um, here it is right here. This is the ACC expert consensus decision pathway. You can easily look this up. Here it is, the link, it's open source. Um, and this is a lawyer who's smiling because you didn't read the article and you missed something and referred them to cardiology and they died while waiting because they had a STEMI equivalent and you didn't know it. Well, I do think that that's like kind of sneaky to do that to us, but we are held responsible for things that come out, updates, even if we don't read them because these guys read them, right? So this is something I would invest some time into learning. We're gonna cover a little bit of it today, um, but knowing how to really navigate it and knowing that chest pain is very, um, is very equivalent, right? That patients don't always go to the ER. Even if you're in primary care, you still need to know who to worry about. So one of my urgent care friends, um, she was like, you know, I really struggle with chest pain in urgent care. And I was like, well, I get it. Patients come to you, they want you to tell them they're fine. So they don't have to go to the ER. And I said, well, how do you make that decision? This would be true for primary care. This is true for me in cardiology, everywhere we work, right? If a patient comes in with chest pain and you can't say if they're having active pain, that it's not ACS, an EKG, whether it's normal or not, is not going to rule them out. So the best thing to do if you're unsure is send an ED. Now, lots of patients, and if you work in urgent care, you know this, they don't want to go, but ultimately you know, need to offer, you need to recommend and document to keep yourself safe as a provider and to make sure the patient understands the risks of not going. So even though you don't work in the ER or urgent care, things I'm going to share with you are relevant because if you don't know them, they can hurt you. And let's talk about it. So one of the recommendations was that you, this is again, going back to STEMI is not enough. Okay. So the reality is that you can have significant occlusions of your coronary arteries and you can have no STEMI. Well, that's pretty interesting because I thought if a heart was really sick, you would always have a clue. That is not always true. You may see some of this in one of our scenarios today. The reality is that I have seen patients with very bad disease who have normal EKGs. This scares me as a provider and I hope it scares you too.
I don't want you to be falsely lulled into the fact that if it's not a STEMI, it's fine. There are other changes, which we're going to talk about, that can indicate occlusion, which is why they've sort of gone to the new terminology of occlusion MI instead of STEMI. Now, STEMIs are still going to be called STEMIs, ST elevation MI. Well, there's other things that are really concerning for ischemia, and they have a list that they've given us. They also are really elevating the threat level of the posterior MI, knowing, knowing that it is a STEMI equivalent if you have a heart attack in the back of your heart. What clues will you have? Well, you'll have depression in V2 and V3. So they're saying, if you see that, be really wary of a posterior MI. You're not going to see a posterior MI ever be called on a a regular EKG, you're only going to see the clues of it in the reciprocal changes, which are the opposite. Okay. So what they did was they made it harder because as a lot of you were just really starting to sort of understand what STEMI is and maybe start to digest what the, you know, numbers are to remember, then they just added this whole other layer of complication to where we need to know these other things too, which are STEMI equivalents. And so that's where this table came out of this article and they said, hey, you know, we also need to kind of worry about well and sign. We definitely need to worry if there's elevation in AVR and we definitely need to worry if there's T-wave inversions. So what does this mean? You need to know where the T-waves are supposed to be upright. And if they're upside down, you need to know where that's normal and not normal. And that's just something we teach you in the basic part of our 30 day. You also, they're recommending, hey, if you have an EKG that's sketch, get somebody higher than you to look at it. Get a cardiology consultation. I don't know where this is possible except for in a hospital, right? But they're saying, hey, have someone higher than you look at it. And if you're not sure, do serial EKGs. I've seen a patient have a STEMI within four minutes is the shortest. Um, I've seen it in five minutes as well. And basically, people can have really fast changes. And so it's okay to do serial EKGs, which is EKGs one after the other, okay? So anyway, this is um, knowing STEMI is not enough, which we talked about. It's a paradigm shift knowing what we have to know now. We need to think about it like that and dump our old paradigm that the earth was flat, that STEMIs were the only thing that mattered because now we have to add occlusion MI. So let's do the big reveal. Are you ready to see the list? It's gonna be intimidating. I'm just gonna tell you, but... We're going to go through a couple of these findings together along with some basics. So here we go. This is the list coming from that article. This is something I recommend you save to your phone um, and have it handy. Okay. Again, you can get that article. Now, these are findings. I'm going to break this up for you on the top here that are significant. These are new STEMI equivalents. Okay. STEMI equivalents. We talked about posterior. That's Honestly, it is a STEMI, so I'm not sure why that even makes the list. Matt just covered scarbosa, so we've check. We know that. Check. There's something called D winters and hyperacute T's, which I think we'll have time to get to. And here's all the criteria should you want to look over it. Now, the stuff on the bottom of the list here, down here, are all things that are significant and are get your booty to the cath lab soon. A ASAP, but not a STEMI. And that's kind of a very simplified way to look at it. Um, what is the Facebook group? The Facebook group, can you put it in either Ruben or Michelle? It's the three-day EKG challenge Facebook group, three-day. And somebody will put in a link for you, Melissa. But going back to these, these are also really important. And here's all the definitions for you to have um, so that you can reference later. And we'll go over a couple of these. So here are some things that I would say, first of all, the machine will not help you, but ultimately these are things that you need to know without a doubt. Like, in fact, if you have time tonight, I would study them and learn them because they are so important. Now, ST depression B2 and B3, they are, that's concerning for posterior MI. AVR with elevation is always significant, okay, always. Wellens warning is a biphasic T wave in V2 and V3. And then D winters has to do with V3 and V4. Those things are always going to say basically non specific ST T wave changes, but it won't, it won't really say what it really is. So that's why you need to know it. 
So how am I supposed to learn this? One bite at a time is the answer, okay? So let's go back to basics, review a little bit on that, including the waves, okay? Not the ocean waves, but the actual EKG waves. And particularly the T waves one to focus on because it is one that matters the most. If you told me what wave would you have, if you had only one, it would be that. And the rules are important because you need to know that, and this is perfect for Valentine's Day, the T wave is right here, okay? It shouldn't be as big as the QRS or almost as big. And if it is, that's called hyperacute. And it also shouldn't be too pointy or too tall. So there are a lot of rules that really matter about the T's. So you should also know that they should be upright in all leads except for AVR and V1. AVR and V1. KG, are you able to copy, copy the Facebook group link into the chat for Melissa? If you can, if you can get it. Otherwise, I can do it on the break. But going back, all the leads should be, all the T's, okay, should be upright except for AVR and V1, the top two. They should be inverted. If anybody else is inverted, that's a problem. You also need to know that if a T wave is symmetric, it's also a problem. If it's asymmetric, that's a really important thing to see because that's what you want. And then you also need to understand that the mom, the dad, and the baby all hold hands together along the EKG. Oh, you found it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so this is the R wave, the dad. The baby is the T, should be nice and small. The mom is the P, and they should all be holding hands together. The mom and the baby should be small. The dad should be tall. Now, going back to the cues, just to briefly revisit that before we go on to some other things, is that the Q is the first negative deflection after the P, and it should be small if there is one. Okay, if it's more than a third the height of the R wave, then it's most likely consistent with ischemia or something pathologic bad. Okay, old MI is usually what it means. It can mean other things. We talked about pulmonary embolus. We talked about hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy as some of the things. Here is an example of how you measure. You go from the tip of here, the R all the way down, and you cut it into thirds. This is a third of the height of the R wave and therefore pathologic. You also don't want them to be wide. So very deep, very wide is bad. So number two rule is don't trust the machine. I will tell you that AI software is getting better. It's not yet found its way into regular software interpretation. So you still actually need to know how to read the EKG which is why it's a good thing that you're here. And this is just showing you that there's an article that was published in Jack 2017, showing you that really um, there is a limit in the accuracy of the software. It can be false positive, it can be false negative. So don't use that, always use your own knowledge. And it's really funny because no matter who you are, whether you're a cardiologist, ER doc, paramedic, EKG tech, PA, NP, whatever you are, none of us are 100% correct. And so it really just takes being sharp on this, knowing your high-risk patterns and being as good as you can, because ultimately a majority of the lawsuits are for missed ACS and we don't, don't want to be in those lawsuits. So here's an example of the machine showing that you're, um, you're you know, it's not always right. And we'll talk about this. So Rodney says, I was in the ER and the nurse reran the EKG over and over until the interpretation didn't see AFib. <laughs> okay, it's one way to do it, but also we could we could just know AFib. That would be even more important. So this one is. Um, let me just point this out to you. This one says normal ECG. Okay, it is not actually normal because the T wave is inverted here, and it shouldn't be. Remember, only two places are here and here. And the other thing that makes this not normal is. The PR interval is 116. It should not ever be under 120. So two things that make this not normal, okay? Um, but it is, right? Uh, it's not normal. So don't believe this. Um, this was an actual EKG spit out at the hospital. Now here's an EKG just to show you. Again, this is from a paramedic who ran this call. I was talking about this earlier. Yeah, also that KJ. But this is at, in the morning, I think it's like 1039 up here. This is your EKG. And you can see that 
Um, it says normal. Mm -hmm. Is it? Is it normal? I don't think so. That's not supposed to be inverted. That T wave is not supposed to be upright. So there's two things that make the CKG not normal. The patient has, good job, Allison. Um, the patient has chest pain. They're 63. So something is brewing. Something is bad. Um, this guy actually, five, four minutes later, developed STEMI. Four minutes later, he had ST elevation in V2 and V3 that was more than two millimeters and he was positive for STEMI. They took him to the cath lab and he got a stent in his LAD and that happened in four minutes. So if you're ever unsure, just get the serial EKG to make sure you don't miss it. How can you do um, serial EKGs? You just leave them hooked up and you leave them in the room. If you're in a clinic, if you're in the ambulance, you can redo it. But if you're unsure or, or just like, I need, I have a sketchy feeling about this patient. I don't feel like things are going right. I'm concerned about their complaint. You can always just check again in a few minutes. So what if there was a way to focus on this time and just focus on the high risk things? That would be the ideal way to learn EKGs is pattern recognition. That's what this all boils down to. And there's one of our instructors, David White, who's the EKG master uh, of the whole 30 day EKG challenge. He's, I think the smartest guy reading EKGs ever. He always says that the high risk patterns look like faces this to him. And he recognizes the faces. That's what this is all about. And just to, to prove this one day, I had a nine-year-old. Yeah, Dave is bomb. I had a nine-year-old uh, little girl, a friend of my, a paramedic's daughter that I was friends with. And I said, hey, can I just, can I just play this game with her? So she, I got the, this uh, EKG arrhythmia generator and I sat with her and she's like wicked smart, but she's, I was like, hey, what's this? And so she started realizing that there was patterns. So she called Wolf Parkinson's white, the eyebrow rhythm, because it looked like an eyebrow, the Delta wave. And she called, you know, VTAC, the butterfly wings, right? But she eventually started recognizing, oh, it's just patterns. And I figure if a nine-year-old can do it, we can too. It's just about taking your time. And yes, David is so easy to understand. I totally agree. And then it's practice, recognizing the pattern and practicing it. So that's what we offer you in our 30 days, time to do both. Well, let's do a case. This is not a real patient's face. And let's start to practice. So chest pain, he's had it for three days. He's clutching his chest. He has what I like to call a trifecta. Hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, you know he is a metabolic uh, recipe for disaster here already. He also used to smoke, that's going against him. And he works in a very high stress industry, which is accounting, especially right now right? Uh, accounting is very stressful. It's always stressful, but even worse. You're dealing with patients, people's money, right? So here's a ZKG. And I know KJ, you're going to bust out what to do here as you always do, but here's the secret. Okay. You're going to go ahead and draw your lines. And what you're looking for is ST elevation and depression for STEMI. You need to have two leads of elevation and two leads of depression. So you could see that there's more than one box of elevation here in two contiguous leads. If you're not sure what contiguous means, it just means fed by the same artery, which is what Michelle was kind of covering this morning or at one o'clock. And two leads that are fed by the same artery with two leads of reciprocal depression, this patient is having a STEMI. And if you can see how minimal these changes are, you could have missed it if you didn't draw your lines. So this is an example of yes, Komal, an inferior MI and KJ said, draw your lines. And so inferior wall MI, this is an occlusion of the right coronary artery. So we need to get them to the cath lab ASAP. So that's that's an easy one, uh, a slam dunker, so to speak. Um, and you can see here it is just with the intervals and it's a little more clean here on this tracing. It's just reproduced for you to see, but in a nutshell, yes, this is an inferior wall MI. So this is um, another one of those findings on the list. This is the top one on the list. This is what it looks like. This is a very subtle presentation of, I will admit, this is what it looks like when you have basically uh, depression, ST depression in V2 and V3, okay? When you have depression in V2 and V3, we think that is reciprocal to the back of the heart. So yes, Allison, that is correct. And this is concerning 
for a posterior MI? So the answer to that would be to get a, a posterior EKG um, as one option, right? V7, V8, and V9, as KJ said, but also you could just send them to the cath lab if you're in the ER, but this was going to be read as nonspecific STT wave changes. It is not nonspecific. This is actually very bad. It needs to go to the cath lab. Right now it's a STEMI equivalent, but it's not going to say that. They're not always going to be this subtle. They'll oftentimes bring along the right coronary artery with them. This one didn't. Isolated posterior MIs are very rare, but they do happen. So keep that on your radar. This is an example of DeWinter's T waves. These are essentially, these are ST depression plus a T wave, a T wave up here that is big or hyperacute. This is another way that the LAD will present as being infarcted. You can also see that the T waves in V1 and V2, as Michelle calls them, sister leads, are big, okay? This one also needs to go to the cath lab because they haven't included left anterior descending. So literally, this is one of the things we always need to look for as well. It's rare, but it will say non-specific ST T wave changes. How many of you, just a quick uh, survey, how many of you have seen the machine say non-specific ST T wave changes? How many of you have seen that? All the time. Okay, so here's a strategy to deal with that. I know everybody, I know Molly, right? All the time, Allison. So what your strategy is, is know that the machine, I know everybody's seen here, the machine is gonna throw everything into a garbage can. And it's up to you to sort out if it has any of these high risk things. So what I do when I see that, I'm like, okay, is there posterior MI? Is there hyperacute T waves? Is there a very prolonged QT? Is there dewinters? Is there wellens? I'm looking for all these things. If I don't see that, it probably is nonspecific, but it's something important until it's not. So you just have to go through your list. And Allison says she gets out her badge, buddy. I literally use my badge all the time at work. I have one on, I work at two places. I have one on each badge. It will not go anywhere without it. And what I'm doing mostly with it is actually looking for the ST depression or elevation. But now with the STEMI equivalence badge that Matt has, I have both of them. So I never forget. It's a good little reminder. Okay, so let's do another fun case. Obviously not a real patient's face. She feels weak, just curious. Which one do you hate more? The complaint of weakness or dizziness? No, it's kind of like, which one do I hate more? I don't know, they're both bad. I don't want either one, <laughs> right? Dizziness, I know me too, actually. I, I really like weak because it can be so many things. P.S. in this lady, we got to check our UA, right? Weak, getting a UA. Weak, getting an EKG. Weak, getting a CBC. Weak, getting a TSH, right? So um, anyway, we're if this is an EKG class, so we're going to definitely show her EKG. But she was in the height of COVID before there was a vaccination. She was sitting in her trailer. And she's pretty lonely. She's 89. Her family doesn't visit her. This is nobody's real face, by the way. And she's like, well, what am I going to do to pass the time? Well, I'll turn on the tube. What does she turn on? The news. How long does she watch the news? For 17 hours. And then her blood pressure's high, which is like not a surprise. It goes to 170 over 110. So her neighbor comes and likes, hey, uh, friend, you got to go to the ER. Your blood pressure is pretty high. I think that's why you don't feel good, even though it, that's just a symptom. It's not the reason, right? There's something else going on, of course. Oh, Silas, you know, you know all the things. So Silas, keep an eye on what he's saying. Anyway, here's her EKG. And uh, you can see that I'm just going to kind of sketch this out for you here. You don't need this. Okay, this gets printed out for you. You don't need this. 
It's not, it's not helpful. So just get rid of that. Just fold it over. You don't need it. Here is your rhythm strip right here. V1. V1 has no discernible P waves. It is irregularly irregular. And therefore, what say you in the chat? Yes. Broken heart. Exactly. Yes, Michelle and Kamal. So this is a patient who was going out of AFib and a flutter. You can see that is here. And you can see what appear to be flutter waves here. It is irregularly irregular. And this patient is not on any anticoagulants. So she would be at risk for a stroke. So good thing you thought about that. But also these T waves are inverted and symmetric. Two very bad things, inverted and symmetric. No good, okay? Also there's inverted here and a little bit of biphasic here. So let me show you what biphasic looks like, okay? So you've got a T wave. Let's see if I can draw it here. It goes up and down. Oops, I can't I can't do it on that. Let me go back. Um, let's see if I can do it here. Up and down, okay? Bi goes up and down in the same T. That is concerning for something called Wellens warning, which is a blocked LED. Yes, Allison is doing all the things. And so uh, KJ and Silas, who were thinking broken heart and Komal, you were actually spot on, spot on. This patient did have broken heart syndrome. And this is what also um, sent her into, I know, thank you, Allison. This sent her into also a fede flutter. And um, she also couldn't see out of her right eye newly. And that was because of a stroke. So they took her to the cath lab. She did not have any occlusive disease, thankfully. Didn't need any stents, but they did notice her ejection fraction was very low, under 35. And when you have an ejection fraction over 30, under 35, you are at risk for two big bad wolf lethal arrhythmias. What are the lethal arrhythmias that you have to worry about with an ejection fraction, a squeeze under 35? Yes, Kamal, VTAC. And yes, VF as well, Allison, strong work. Yes. And Allison says repetition. So Allison and KJ, uh, they, you know, it's like exercise. They're always here. They're putting in the reps. That's why they know the answers. And this really is just putting in the reps, right? These are like bicep curls. And once you really just practice it and dedicate, right, then you're good to go. Yeah, Missy, this is, uh, oh, I love what Michelle put. Two heart, one lung on brain. So biphasic is bad, usually concerning for ischemia, inverted symmetric concerning for lots of things, but especially ischemia, um, but can also mean cardiomyopathy, which is what Takasubos is. Okay. Broken heart syndrome. It's also just a dilated cardiomyopathy. So patients with EFs under 35, they're very high risk and we need to uh, protect them. So Missy says we see EF of 12. I had a patient with an EF uh, under six the other day. And I was like, what? But Allison says life best time. So that's, that's the point. Okay. You can't put an ICD in these people when you get a new diagnosis of under 35, you, you can't, because a lot of them are going to improve with guideline directed medical therapy with heart failure management. And because, you know, 40 something percent is going to go up with medical management, you would hate for everybody to have an ICD. So while you're waiting for their EF to prove with medicines that are really great now, honestly, I feel like it's really a great uh, bucket of things to reach for now for heart failure. A lot of people will get better. And so you can protect them. There's two things out there. There's a life vest and a Kestra device or the same thing. They go into the clothes and it can kind of like a bridge device until you sort out if they need a, a ICD. Now, normally what we'll do, check again in a couple months to get a limited echo and just see right? Yeah. GDMT, come on. And GDMT is really great nowadays. It's just getting better and better. And what's really interesting to me, a side note, sorry to detour, but uh, we don't need as much diuretics for patients anymore for heart failure when we're using these new agents, which is kind of cool because we're not taxing the kidneys as much, which is great. Thank you for putting the definitions in there, you guys. I love the teamwork. Um, so her EF was under 35. You can see here. She had on her echo read, if you've never seen these, she had some distal apical akinesis. What does that mean in English? It just means that the bottom part of the heart wasn't moving well, akinesis. 
And she also had some thickening of the left ventricle, but that's like more chronic. It's not right now it's happening. And also, you know, there was some mitral regurg. Sometimes that happens when you have CHF, um, something to watch. And, you know, her dilated atrium, those make me concerned about future AFib, but she's already had that. So um, this is someone who's, you know, definitely going to be protected with a VEST guideline direct medical therapy and also going to be put on um, an anticoagulation, right? Depending on what her kidney function is and her weight, you'll choose an anticoagulant. So this is another EKG, one of those findings, see the face, memorize it, know it. This is going to be read as nonspecific. It's very not nonspecific. Very, very, very. Yes, Kamal, thank you for, for putting that in there, all the, the classes. Thank you. Oh, um, KJ, you, you know we always got your back, 100%. So this patient is 78, has shoulder pain when he works out at the gym. You know what KJ is going to tell us to do. KJ is going to say, draw your lines. Well, let's go do that. We have an accusation from the machine of nonspecific. Let's go see what's happening over here. It's definitely some depression showing up that's significant, okay? And over here, there's something massively significant. This is ST elevation. And then we've got some pretty significant depression in one in AVL. So what's interesting is I've got depression over here, which is totally unrelated to V4. So it's now we describe that as a widespread depression a widespread depression, okay, with elevation in ADR. So Kamal, yes, you are right to be concerned about a left main occlusion or even um, a, a very proximal left anterior descending. The moral of the story is this is one of those findings on the bottom of the list that you can't miss, okay? So widespread depression plus AVR elevation of more than one millimeter, this is something that needs to go to the cath lab right now. Not a STEMI but should be treated similar to one. Don't ever discharge this patient with an EKG like this. However, however, um, there is a caveat. If they're fast and they have this, it could be a demand ischemia. So the Wellens is a little different. And the Wellens goes up and then down, up and then down. This one just is down. So. Um, it's not really considered that um, per se, but I'm glad you mentioned it so we could show you the difference. Okay, so, all right, cool. Let's keep going with more findings. This is a patient, not anybody's real faces, of course. Um, palpitations for three days. He says, I feel like I'm going to pass out. He's got the trifecta of risk. And she says, oh, I'm going to take you to the clinic. Why? Why does that always happen? These patients should be going to the emergency department, but sometimes they find you at the clinic, even in primary care, right? This happens all the time and you have to sort it out. So that's okay. We're going to do an EKG and find out what's going on with him. So here we go. Um, oh, actually, sorry. We'll come back to him, but this guy, chest pain, let's do him. His EKG is really bad, actually. Um, he doesn't want to go to the emergency room. He's had bad chest pain for three days now. And <laughs> yes, sometimes people are stubborn. He has one kidney. Keep that in mind. Um, she says, please go to the hospital, dad. He says, yeah, my pain is, it's a pressure. It's worse with walking, which is known as exertional chest pain. Um, high copays, wait times. Exactly. All the reasons. I totally get it. His pain is six on a 10. It's been going on for three days. It's constant. So here's his EKG. And he indeed did have a, a STEMI five minutes later. EKG says, STT of abnormality, consider lateral ischemia. Okay, let's do that. Let's consider. So you've got some T-wave inversions in the lateral leads. So, okay, I'll go with that. But you know, here's the thing, this patient actually has something called hyperacute T waves. We talked about those a little bit earlier, we're bringing them back. 
These are something that are now a semi-equivalent hyperacutes, a T wave that is too big for its own QRS. Okay. If it's too big, it's too big in relationship to its QRS. It's technically hyperacute. The one in V4, Allison, what do you think of that T wave over there? Hey, Matt. Um, yeah, hyperacute T waves. Good job, Allison. See, that's what I'm talking about. Allison puts in the reps. So yes, Kamal already got it. And so did KJ. V4 is biphasic. You go up and then you go down. And that is also a problem. Always ischemia till proven otherwise. So this patient was a STEMI and got stents in the circumflex and in the LAD. Five minutes later had even more uh, problems in V2 and V3, had ST elevation as well, and went straight to the cath lab. But, you know, it used to be, you know, back when Matt and I started teaching a long time ago, we would always, um, yeah, it's not yet a STEMI, Amy, but it's it turned into one because he'd need to have two millimeters of ST elevation, but you're seeing the precursor, which is the hyperacute T waves. And so when Matt and I first taught this back in the day, it was really just T waves that were uh, hyperacute or pre-STEMI. But the, the guidelines now say, oh yeah, these need to go to the cath lab because they're realizing this is what happens right before you STEMI. And they want to catch the heart, right? Time is muscle. So, so I'm really glad they put this into the guidelines. The problem is, is that now everybody needs to um, be aware of it, right? Everybody needs to have it on their radar. And if you don't, then unfortunately you're left kind of at risk. So hopefully this makes sense to you. The uh, inverted symmetric is a problem. So are these hyperacute T's? Okay, that's a pre-STEMI indicator. This was somebody also just to throw in a commercial for patients who are young, but sometimes have severe disease. So this is not on the list, but I threw it in here because this is something that could easily be overlooked if we didn't really deep dive into it. So she was a patient who had diabetes, type one. She had renal failure. She was on dialysis and she also had hypertension and hyperlipidemia at 24. So she was unconscious. The ambulance arrived and they picked her up and they were like, oh no, she's unconscious. So they checked her blood sugar. It was in the thirties. They gave her D50. She woke up and she said, oh, I've got chest pain. It's so bad. My chest pain. You're 24. You have chest pain. Okay. Take you to the hospital. So they take her to the hospital. The EKG is read as old inferior wall MI. Why did it say that? And what are they going to do with that and chest pain in a 24 year old? Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, it was initially overlooked. But then later they were like, oh, maybe we should look into this. You know, you are not a 24 year old heart. You actually have a heart of a 70 year old because of all your comorbidities. So um, she actually had. These are cues, okay? So cues are pertinent, present, only three. And as KJ said, draw your lines. So what do you do? You go from the tip to the R to the bottom, and you're looking to see if it's at least one third the height. It is, and so it is a pathologic cue. This lady ended up getting two stents, okay? Two stents. And so knowing risk, good job, Kamal. Knowing risk is really important and also understanding that the heart age is really critical, not just the patient's age. And when you throw in also something else that should be on your radar, no matter where you work, except for if you're on the ambulance, well, even if you're on the ambulance, honestly, if somebody has familial hyperlipidemia, which is a genetic you know, problem in the, in the LDL receptors to where somebody has very high cholesterol when they're very young and it runs in the family, that's something to be concerned about. So in LD over 190, total cholesterol over 290, they probably have familial hyperlipidemia. Why should that be on your radar? Because it leads to young disease. Young disease, very bad disease. So those patients need to be treated like they're 70 years old, okay, till proven otherwise. So hopefully this was super helpful to kind of go over some of the findings. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments before we take a little break for our last session of the day? I'm loving all this that Michelle says, no cues, watch out for them. So is this helpful so far? So type in the chat, has this been helpful? Has this been fun? 
so far, having all the guests. Yeah, right. Okay. We're going to come back and wrap up the day with some scenarios. And I'm really hoping that some of you will want to be brave and come off mute and practice with us. That would be so great. Um, Missy, wicked smart, as Denise would say. Rodney, can't wait for the, the replay. Awesome. Yes, um, so fun. So we're going to come back. We're going to get kicked off right at 3.30 Pacific Standard. Okay, I'm excited too, Matt. This has been so fun. We're going to come back and we're going to do scenarios. And let me just stop our recording.